Good morning. You are on the Reading Circle with Mark Medley. Good morning. This is Nikki Giovanni. How are you? Nikki Giovanni, I am blessed and honored and so glad to hear your voice. Good to see you here you this morning. It's good to hear you as well. Thank you so much right off the bat. I thank you for taking the time to do the interview. Not a problem. And I am so excited. My callers have been calling in all week long. My <laughs> listeners have been calling. Is Nikki going to do the show? Is Miss Giovanni going to do the show? Is Ms. And I said, yes, we've confirmed. I've, I've spoken with her representative. We've emailed each other. I've left messages. As far as I know, she's going to do the show. Absolutely. And I am thrilled and honored that you've taken the time to speak with us this morning. Oh, I'm delighted. Well, I tell you, I'm going to read your bio to the folks for anyone who's been under a rock for the last umpteen <laughs> years and who do, would not know who you are. I'm going to read that for them. And it's long, and still I want to read all of it because I need folks to understand of someone who has been there for a while and been in the struggle and is still there and still enjoys life and is still there. Oh, thank so, you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to read the whole thing. So if it takes a couple of minutes, then so be it. Okay. All right. Nikki Giovanni is a world-renowned poet, writer, commentator, activist, and educator. Over the past 30 years, her outspokenness in her writing and in lectures has brought the eyes of the world upon her. One of the most widely read American poets, she prides herself on being black American, a daughter, a mother, a professor of English. Giovanni remains as determined and committed as ever to the fight for civil rights and equality. Always insisting on presenting the truth as she sees it, she has maintained a prominent place as a strong voice of the black community. Her focus is on the individual, specifically on the power one has to make a difference in oneself and thus in the lives of others. Nikki Giovanni was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, and grew up in Lincoln Heights, an all-black suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio. She and her sister spent the summers with their grandparents in Knoxville, and she graduated with honors from Fisk University, her grandfather's alma mater, in 1968. After graduating from Fisk, she attended the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University. She published her first book of poetry, Black Feeling Black Talk, in 1968 and within the next year published a second book, thus launching her career as a writer. Early in her career, she was dubbed the Princess of Black Poetry, and over the course of more than three decades of publishing and lecturing, she has come to be called both a national treasure and most recently one of Oprah Winfrey's 25 living legends. Many of Giovanni's books have received honors and awards. Her autobiography, Gemini, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Love Poems, Blues, for all the changes in quilting, the Black Eyed Peas were all honored with NAACP Image Awards. Blues, for all the changes, re reached number four on the Los Angeles Times bestseller list, a rare achievement for a book of poems. Most recently, her children's picture book, Rosa, about the civil rights legend Rosa Parks, became a Caldecott Honors book. And Brian Collier, the illustrator, was given the Coretta Scott King Award for the best illustration. Rosa also received number three on the New York Times bestseller list. Giovanni's spoken word recordings have also achieved widespread recognition and honors. Her album, Truth, is on its way, on which she reads her poetry against a background of gospel music, was a top 100 album and received the best spoken word album given by the National Association of Radio and Television Announcers. Her Nikki Giovanni's poetry collection, on which she reads and talks about her poetry, was one of the five finalists for a Grammy Award. Giovanni's honors and awards have been steady and plentiful throughout her career. The recipient of some 25 honorary degrees, she has been named Woman of the Year by Mademoiselle Magazine, The Ladies Home Journal, and Ebony Magazine. She was tapped for the Ohio Women's Hall of Fame and named an Outstanding Woman of Tennessee. Giovanni has also received Governor's Awards from both Tennessee and Virginia. She was the first recipient of the Rosa L. Parks Woman of Courage Award, and she has also been awarded the Langston Hughes Medal for Poetry. She's an honorary member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority and has received lifetime membership and scroll from the National Council of Negro Women. A member of PEN, or PEN, she has was honored for her life and career by the History Makers. She has received the keys to more than two dozen cities. A scientist who admires her work even named a new species of bat he discovered for her. The author of some 30 books for both adults and children, 
Nikki Giovanni is a university distinguished professor at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. Ms. Giovanni, again, I am honored. Welcome to the Reading Circle with Mark Medley. Thank you. Well, i tell you what, let's get started, because i tell you what caught my attention was I saw you earlier in the year being interviewed by Bill Moyers uh-huh. on the show, and you were talking about your book, Bicycles. Right. And it was in the February time frame around Valentine's Day, and I'd say, oh, wow, that would be a wonderful <laughs> Valentine's gift. Thank and you. sure enough, I went out and bought the book for the Valentine's gift. I loved it. I started reading it, and I said, I'm going to contact her and see if she'll do the show. Okay. So whenever I emailed you, Miss Fowler emailed me back and said, yeah, sure, she'd love to do the show. And I almost <laughs> fell off my chair. I'm like, you're kidding me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and she said, no, she'll do the show. And we set the date and everything, and then we were going back and forth. And sure enough, September the 12th is here. So, again, I am thrilled. We'll talk about your book, Bicycles, and anything else you'd like to talk about. We can talk about current events. We can talk about past events. Because, again, for my listening audience, I think it is critical that they understand where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. And it's interesting because I'm an adjunct professor at one of the local community colleges. And last night, because I teach public speaking, and, and we were talking about... Uh, word choice in your speeches. Mm-hmm. So we come upon the point where we talk about how certain words, how we act as filters. Right. Like it can bring up experiences and you shut down and you stop listening to what the speaker is talking about. Mm-hmm. So I placed the word boy on the board and I said, does anyone see a problem with that word? So a few people that were a little bit older, they understood exactly where I'm going. But I had this young man who was 24 years old, and he was debating and arguing that there was nothing wrong with that word. So finally, I just asked him, I said, well, how old are you? And he said, 24. And I said, oh, that explains, you wouldn't know. You would not. And he he truly, I mean, he was trying to really debate me that the media makes too much. But then a couple of other people in the class kind of gave him the history yeah. and how depending on how boy is used, it could be racially charged. Oh, yeah. And I thought at that point, how sad that there are people that, I mean, and at the same one, maybe it's sad, maybe it's a double-edged coin. Maybe it's sad and maybe it's a good thing. Yeah. But there are people that really don't understand what the struggle has been, I guess, based on the fact that it's, I guess, it supposedly looks pretty good now. It looks better than it did. Right. (laughs) (laughs) No question about that. (laughs) But certainly we have to understand what has happened in the past to connect us to what's going on now and in the future. And that's one of the reasons why I was so excited whenever you agreed to do, because you are a link to the past, the present, and the future. Thank you. And you had the opportunity, because I see your professor down at Virginia Tech, you have the yes. opportunity to continue to touch lives and to educate. Oh, yeah. No, p- teaching is one of the real joys in life, because all writers, I think, are teachers. We want uh, to convey something. And then to be able to do it in the classroom, you get to meet young people. They bring things to you that you, your, your young man bringing boy, who, who didn't understand yet, had you said, you know, boy, shut up. Right. Would immediately take an offense. Correct. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And the funny thing about it, because I said the next example I put up was you people. Right. Now, that one he resonated with. He said, now, that, that's, a, that's, that's derogatory. Oh, I said, yeah, well, oh, wait yeah. a minute. I said, now, how did you pick up that one? So then the class said, well, that one's international. I said, okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I said, I'll take that one. So I'll tell you what. You have over 30 books. And I th- is, the, is Bicycles the last one, or is there I, another one since then? No, no, no. Bicycles is the, late, the latest one, and... uh mm-hmm. I took the summer off. I, I got teased because, you know, when you teach in a university, everybody always says, and what are you working on? You know, right. I don't care what you've achieved, just what are you working on? <laughs> and I said, you know, last year I had four books out. Uh, Bicycles was one for adults. Um, uh, the Grasshopper Song, which was an illustrated children's um, um, book. We looked at the grasshopper and the ants, the old Aesop myth. Hip Hop Speaks to Children was okay. an edited um Anthology and Lincoln and Douglas uh, and American Friendship, which looking at the friendship of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. So there was quite an achievement to have four books um, to come out at the same year. And so people were saying, you know, what are you working on? So I'm really relaxing. I'm working on. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think you, you deserve to relax a little bit. <laughs> oh yeah, if you don't ever recharge. So I didn't. My, my nails grew long this summer. People that saw me, everybody could tell immediately. You can look at a writer's hands and tell when they're writing. You know, <laughs> and, and everybody looked at me and said, "You're not writing." Oh no, I mean, I had fingers that looked like you know. <laughs> Susie May down on the corner. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> 
So now, where, because again, in your bio, I agree with you in terms of poetry books, because I have worked with authors who have written poetry books. As a matter of fact, I helped, helped produce one with a, with a teaching friend of mine who wanted to publish and everything. Mm -hmm. And poetry books, you're right, generally have a rough road. How do you explain how successful your poetry books have been and how they've climbed the charts to being world renowned for the most part and, and the Grammys and, New York Times bestseller list, because that really is kind of unprecedented for poetry books. Uh, it is unprecedented for a book of poetry, and I just I think I'm lucky, you know, so I'm very happy about that. And I think that um, my my work is accessible, and I think even maybe people that wouldn't be uh, enchanted with me uh, at least know that they're getting an honest assessment. And I think probably all of that plays in. But uh, I've also always wanted to play on that on that on that field. That um, and uh, one doesn't write a book to be a bestseller, right? Uh, but when one writes a book, one would like to make it thus. Yes, <laughs> you know that's correct. And it's not uh, it's it's not the money deal. It's that you want to finally say because there's not. I mean, God knows you probably know that there's no money. There's no real money in poetry itself. Right. Well, but, that's that's what's fascinating about your success. Well, it, it's just again. Well, you know, Langston Hughes. Uh, I was explaining or trying to explain in my class the other day. When you look at American poets. What you're looking at, I mean, if we roll it all the way back, what we're looking at are people with inherited wealth who wrote poetry. And then we're looking at a few people who were poor, like Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote poetry, whose poetry ultimately became uh, extremely successful. Everybody in the world knows the Raven. Correct. But Poe himself died, you know, of tuberculosis, you know, sitting on a park bench or something. So when we start to look at people who actually put bread on the table, we're looking at black American poets, which to me is a fascinating uh, subject. We're looking at Paul Lawrence Dunbar, right. who not only took care of himself, he bought his mother a house next door. And we're looking at another young man who took care of himself and his mother, Langston Hughes. Correct. And then we come to the black arts movement, and we begin to carve another path in American um, uh, arts and letters. One, we are uh, essentially very truthful. And though the old po poetry establishment says, well, we're not sure if it's really poetry, what they really didn't want was we're, we're afraid that it really is truthful. Correct. And uh, we did that, and I think the public responded. And in doing so, uh, I think all of us are very proud to say we helped uh, pave that path that uh, that the hip-hop generation has been able to go down. Well, it's funny because when you talk to children, and again, working in the school system, and working with children, and, and I was a language arts teacher whenever I was in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that the children did not connect the fact that rap or hip-hop is a form of poetry. Yeah, that, that's why it's called teaching. Correct. <laughs> that's <laughs> our child. That's right. Which is what, exactly what I wanted my book, uh, Hip-Hop Speaks to Children, to do. Because, of course, the kids are not going to connect it. One of the geniuses of the American, uh, of the black American cultural experience has been that we have stayed in the now. And in staying in the now, it's kept us sane and it's made us strong. But our job as scholars is also to say, but there was a then. That's and correct. So, yeah, and so I wanted, and Hip Hop Speaks to Children, uh, which I think is a lovely book, I wanted to go back and connect some dots. I wanted to connect some dots with the, uh, for example, the Holiness Church, because we needed to roll it back right. to at least the Holiness Church, because you've got that cadence. That's and right. hip-hop is going to speak of the rappers come into that cadence. But if we go back there, then we need to go back to the slave experience. We Correct. need to go back to the plantation because it's going to be the embracing of a, of, a, of a metaphor, which is going to be a religious metaphor, but nonetheless a good one, so that they're going to have a common, a common talk. And they put the Africanisms that they remembered into this uh, uh, myth mythology or into this uh, acceptance, or however you want to look at it. I'm not trying to put religion on anybody. No, no, but I into this understand. acceptance of Jesus, so we had a metaphor. Right. And now we have a common way to talk about something. And because we were in, because we had an enforced illiteracy, we had to find a way to pass a story along, so we passed it along in a beat. Correct. And, and that beat is going to come all the way up into the 21st century. It's a fabulous story. So I wanted to be able to put that together in an anthology. And we did. We, we went all the way back to the creation by James Weldon Johnson. Right. We, we, uh, we went all the way back, you know, bringing it up and through the blues. We came all the way out to Queen Latifah and, and, and Erica Badu. We, we brought it, you know, so step by step. The kids and listening to this and the CD comes with it. They could listen to uh, a, a most deaf. They can listen to the whole thing, Tribe Called uh, Quest, and begin to see where it comes from. 
So uh, our job was to, to, to help that process and hopefully to get the kids raised in questions, and I think they do. Chuck D and them, I mean, the hip-hop generation, by the way, is very smart. Right. And, um, I, and which you, you know, and you look at a kid like Jay-Z, mm-hmm. I mean, who wouldn't want him for your son? Exactly. You know, he's a great kid, and and, and, uh, and Sean Puffy is, is a smart, these are good these are good businessmen, too. Well, they are, and that's that's the other piece in terms of, like, you're talking about education. A lot of the kids, they just see the end result. They didn't see everything that had gone into what happened prior to them getting there. A lot of people don't realize that Puffy was college-educated. Oh, yeah, but, he, went to, he went to Howard. Exactly. Program. But we also know that Puffy recognized when he had what he needed. Correct. We also know that Jay-Z, for example, did not. Correct. But he continued to educate himself correct and so we we I, I, I um i was not enchanted with barack obama's uh speech and i'll tell you why uh, and, and i'm not trying to seek agreement here no no no. go ahead so, feel free now have a man who is the 44th president of the united states he occupies a job that 44 other men have occupied right correct so how do you have an ambition for that how do you tell the kids you can't be a rapper, you can't necessarily go out and play football, but your ambition was to be one of 44 in 300 years. Correct. A dream is a dream. That's and correct. what makes your dream of being president any more important than uh, Susie May's dream of being, you know, a Hollywood star or Beverly Johnson, let me just give a name here, Beverly Johnson's uh, dream of being a, a top model. Correct. What, what, what makes that? Don't, don't sit there and tell kids what you can't be. And what they they shouldn't strive to do because you you're in a position that nobody in their right mind would have thought you could be in. This is correct. So come on, say you know yeah hey dream big and what the hell. <laughs> if, if, if it doesn't work, you know you be the first to know. <laughs> well, I, I I agree, and I think the the point is whatever your dream is, be excellent at it. Be excellent at it and follow it, pursue it, and learn what you have to learn. But I'm not going to tell you, you know, golly, you can't be a, a poet because right. after all, you know. That, you know, poets don't earn a living. Well, I can think of three that do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's interesting because it, the, the, even I remember when I was about to go to college, my, my original choice to major was going to be in English or music. And mm-hmm. my father said, no, nah, I'm not going to support that because you won't right. make any money at it. So I switched my major and went into business administration. Mm-hmm. And I did business. I worked for a large corporation for 15 years. And it gotten to the point where I went back to my first love, which was education. Right. So ultimately, I wound up going back to my first love, and I do make money at it. And, and so I know exactly what you're saying. It's not as if you can't tell somebody what they can't be. But at the same time, I guess he was trying to get across, you know, broad. your horizons because usually i tell the kids i have no issue with you wanting to be a basketball player or a football player just have a plan b if it doesn't work like you said if it doesn't work out hey i have other skills to do something else exactly but mostly if that's what you're if that's what you want to do right then you do it as the there's an old uh one of the the the, uh uh, disco groups that i grew up with i'm older than you i think you know do it do it, do it, do it till you're satisfied. satisfied. Whatever it is. <laughs> that's right. I, oh, I remember that one when I was a kid. I love that. I re- but, uh, that's BT Express. Yes, it was. Yes. That's right. Because you just you just can't keep telling people this is the way you have to do it because this is what I understand. Right. The fears of the of the past cannot inform the dreams of the future. Correct. Is that kind of basic. That's correct. Now, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about your first book and now up to bicycles. Does it feel any different for you? So stay there and we'll be right back. They say America is the land of opportunity. Where kids can grow up and become anything they want. But for some of us, it's not so easy. Today, one out of every six children in America lives in poverty. That's almost 13 million of us. That's almost 13 million of us. Living below the poverty line. The poverty line divides us all into those who have and those who never have enough. Not enough food or medicine. Or even a place to live. When you live in poverty, every day is hard. But we don't want a handout. We want a way out. A way out of poverty for me and my family. For good. This is America. This is America. Together, we can do so much. Will you help? Nearly 13 million children in America live below the poverty line. You can make a difference in more ways than you know. Go to PovertyUSA.org and get involved. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. 
WP 88.7 is sponsored by the brand new lounge at the Riverside Manor. For more information, please visit them online at www.theriversidemanor.com or Facebook at the Riverside Manor Lounge. They're located on the border of Fairlawn and Patterson, right on the corner of Route 20 North and East 33rd Street. Thursday nights are ladies' nights, Friday nights are Latin nights, and Saturday nights are reserved for the grown and sexy. The new lounge at Riverside Manor is proud to support WP 88.7 FM. Hello, I'm Martha, bringing you Sounds of Gospel Music from 7 to 9 every Saturday here on WP88.7 FM on your dial. So I'll cherish the old rugged old The Reading Circle on WP88.7 FM. That's right. For those of you who happen to be joining us for the first time, this is the Reading Circle with Mark Medley. And my very, very, very special guest this morning is the world-renowned poet, writer, commentator, activist, and educator, and a fine woman, a fine human being, none other than Nikki Giovanni. And, Ms. Giovanni, I'll tell you, you created an excitement for my show that I hadn't had up until this point in terms of <laughs> folks calling. When I put out the word early on that Nikki Giovanni was going to be on the show in September, I started getting phone calls from <laughs> folks. Even one lady called last week and said, did I miss it? And, oh, I, no. and I said, did you miss what? And she said, was Nikki on this week? And I said, no, she's next week. Oh, good. I definitely I'm ready. So, oh, that's so if you're nice. listening out there, Sister Ivy, and I know that you are, Miss Giovanni is on the airwaves, and I am so grateful for it. Oh, thank you. And I asked a question prior to the break in terms of your first book. You wrote that back in the 60s and now we're into 2009 did you is there does is any different for you the feeling that you get from when you wrote the first book to now you're up to bicycles you know um there's always a nervousness and uh, somebody else said you know if an artist is not nervous that she's not doing something right that's correct i agree <laughs> Wait, we teach that in the public speaking course if you're not real nervous before giving your speech yeah you don't know what you're doing <laughs> <laughs> that's a fact but uh, I, I really like that book, and it, it's, of course it's been in print for low these 40-something years. Uh, what we did, that we were searching, and I think that um, as a writer, I have continued to search. So sometimes, um, which, which I think is a compliment, by the way, people will say to me, you know, why, how, how do you stay fresh? Well, I stay Correct. fresh because they're new, there's still questions. And I, uh, there's, there's uh, just very little repetition in, in what I'm seeking. I, I seek questions of justice, but we continue to seek uh uh, ways in which that becomes fulfilled. Correct. Yeah. And in terms of, again, from a historical point of view, and it's funny how you were saying people ask you, how do you stay fair? Because one of my questions would be, where does your material, where does it come from or what you're laying down on paper? Where does that come from out of Giovanni, out of Nikki? Where does that come from? Well, I'm a big fan of history. I have always been. And uh, had the good fortune to grow up with a grandfather who was a Latin scholar, though my Latin is very limited, he tried to teach me. But also he was very fond of Greek mythology. And as we know, so much of the Greek mythology actually is, is coming, you know, from, from uh, Sudan and from Egypt. Correct. So you get to learn so very much if you learn a couple of little fairy tales, not fairy tales, uh, uh, Aesop fables. Right. If you, you get to learn a few things and you start to trace them back, you begin to see the connections. And I recently, I don't know if any of your, your listening audience, uh, but I recently made a friend, uh, which is good, but that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, she's an older Jewish lady, and she plays Mahjong. Okay. And I don't know Mahjong. And, you know, black women uh, don't. We play bridge, or Correct. we play, um, uh, I, I'm in uh, a, a bid whist uh, okay. group. And we play bid whist just right. about twice a month, you know, right. we get together. But she plays Mahjong. And so Rosalind was being very helpful. She said, well, I'll come down, and I'll teach you all. So now we're saying, why is it? How did this become a Jewish game? Right. And she said, you know, I don't know. And so we started looking up because, you know, Mahjong is, is, is uh, Chinese. Okay. It, its origin is Chinese, as is uh, the story of Cinderella, for example. All right. And so what we had to realize as we started to look in, you could do so much with a map, geography. 
we looked at it because what you got are trade routes because the Jewish uh, people are nomadic and have been tradesmen, right? The Chinese traded with everybody. This is an old and great civilization. And so what we have is a game the Chinese men played that as they're trading, it was taught to Jewish men who for some reason didn't pick it up, but their wives did, the women did. Very interesting, you know, and that's just that's just trade. Well, it so is. you look at history and you say to yourself, everything has an antecedent. So anything you pursue, you anything you pursue, any any level of knowledge that interests you is going to open up doors, 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 doors. Correct. Mm -hmm. And I I tell people all the time, we ought to learn something new every day. Look how small it is. Yeah. It doesn't have to be anything gigantic or large or momentous. Every day you should learn something new, and you just gave me my something new, <laughs> talking about Marja. <laughs> well, if you look at the tiles, you see immediately why. You know, you know, okay, this has something to do with the Chinese. Right. And so the history of the game is that this is a Chinese game. So you, once you, you Google it, you'll see that. All right. So the question is going to be, well, how did it become right. something that Jewish women play? <laughs> And so that's the question. The question has to be there's there. These connections has to be trade. So it's just, again, fascinating how people talk or how people not talk, but de develop uh, connections. Right. Yeah. Now, in terms of being in the civil rights movement, because I can re and, and being with Dr. King and because uh, I remember very clearly I was about five or six years <laughs> oh, old whenever uh, yeah. Dr. King was assassinated. And I yeah. remember that day. I remember running into the bathroom and hiding in the bathtub because I didn't know what had happened, but I knew something bad had happened. And my oh, yeah. parents were crying and everybody was sad. And I and, and I, I am like one of the biggest civil rights era Martin Luther King fans out there. Now, that area I've studied. I've studied that, and I've studied that. But to actually talk with someone who actually was with those folks, what was that like? Well, you know, you were doing your job, and I think when you talk to the foot soldiers, which is all I was, you know, I, I, I marched, but, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, I didn't do anything. I, I've never tried to say that I did. I just did what I was being asked to do. I was a good driver, so I drove people places. But... Uh, 68 was a, a particularly difficult year uh, historically for the world because we lost uh, Martin, of course, in uh, June, and then, uh, excuse me, in April, right. and then and Bobby Kennedy Bobby. was assassinated in right. June. So it was a hard year um, in America, and it's a year that uh, uh, you really begin to just see how, how horrible people like Richard Nixon and them were. And you knew that, the, the, well, there's still, uh, right. Correct. There's, there's no satisfaction Correct. when you killed Martin Luther King uh, Jr. at this particular point. That's right. And, and there won't be until until somebody finally admits who did it. Correct. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I agree with you. But there's no satisfaction on who killed Abraham Lincoln. That's correct. Because the idea that, that, that this actor just all of a sudden woke up one morning and said, oh, I think I'll kill the president is ridiculous. I agree. I think all of them are ridiculous. I think Lincoln, Kennedy, King, <laughs> but all of them are ridiculous in but terms of... But they're all of... being linked by a couple of things that, you know, it's probably unwise to say on the radio at right. o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we did our disclaimer. Yes, we did. The, the, the views that may not express the opinions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you know, guns are a bad idea, and that was the other thing that I was disappointed. Um, and I'm not upset with, with, with the president particularly, right. but you have to assume if you're going to be president of the United States, uh, the we, we, United States shoots people, whether you're poet or president or anything else. That's so right. you get today's job done today. But to tell schools children we're going to do everything we can to help and not follow that up with, and here is the bill that's going to outlaw guns right. and the uh, 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 accessibility of ammunition, it's ridiculous because the most thing that most kids, inner city kids, but now rural kids too, we've had terrible murders all over the country. Well, yes. Because guns are accessible. And, and Patterson, New Jersey is on that map now to the point wherein the, the city leadership was considering a curfew for not only children but for adults. We had six or seven murders in yeah. August. Sure. And, and you're and right. And gun murders. Yes, they yeah. were, all of them. Yeah. And somebody said, well, you, if somebody wants to kill you, they can't stop you. But if you have to walk up so on somebody and strangle them, it kind of cuts down on the number of people who will be killed. <laughs> That's correct. And it certainly does cut down on the fear that those of us who are walking the streets have. That is correct. And, it's again, like I said, we suffered. We've gone through that <laughs> period along with Newark and other cities around the country. And uh, interestingly enough, you still have toy makers who make toy guns. Yeah. Because I was sitting on my porch one time during the summer, and I was reading a book. As a matter of fact, that's what I generally do is I'm always reading. And I looked out, and I saw the kids, and they had these guns. Yeah. And they were actually, I mean, and, and, and I realized, but still, 
it was so natural for them to put that toy gun to the other one's head. Yeah. And they would pull the trigger. And I told somebody, I told my neighbor then, I said, see, that's how they get started. Yeah, but it's not their fault. That's but true. you know, nobody plays cowboy and Indian anymore. Right. You never seen that anymore. When I grew up, everybody played cowboy and Indian. Right. And the cowboys killed the Indians. And then there was the American Indian Movement, AIM. And all of a sudden, we don't play cowboy and Indian anymore. Right. And we need to stop playing, uh, as you say, with, with guns. Because if we let the kids have it, of course... But I don't read the Second Amendment that way. I don't read the Second Amendment that the people, because the people has been the state, and the state has a right to raise a militia. Um, um, uh, a militia. Right. But that doesn't mean, doesn't mean that you have a right to walk into, as we in Virginia are trying to pass, say, I live in Virginia. All right. That's my final state. A law that says you can have a concealed gun in a bar. Well, right. What kind of sense does that make? Exactly. Now you mix an alcohol and firearms. And, and then somebody said, well, you know, uh, Barack, because that was a part of what wants to take away our our our, our guns, because you know, and we're hunters. It, we're not hunters, because when I go hunting, I go to Kroger's right. and I go to the meat department. That's hunting. <laughs> you know, going out in the field shooting at little animals that never hurt you. I mean, you're shooting a deer like I shot a deer. Well, the deer, even if the deer was raving, angry with you, can't hurt you. Right. For God's sake, it, it's time that we stop that. The idea that that spilling something's blood is a good idea. It's not a good idea. And it's more than time that we, we sent the message to youngsters and, 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 and begin by, you know, you can't take a gun into Jamaica, play or anything else. It's more than, than, than time that we said, okay, this is time to stop this. Right. It, it's true. I agree because people need to understand the difference and yeah. what is happening. As I, said, as I watch those kids play with that, sure. th between the combination of that and then now you have games on the video games such oh. as Grand Theft Auto and that, that are so violent. And again, what it desensitizes. It, of course it does. It and de it, that's a terrible thing. It is. Yeah. And we can somehow have an industry that does that, but we, we can't have Jim. Right. You know, and we can find money in public schools, which, again, I was disappointed. We can find money in public schools to buy drugs, to buy Ritalin for our young Oh, don't, don't yeah. even get me started on Ritalin. But, but we don't have any money to, to give them a hot breakfast? You, you mean we can't fix a, a pot of grits right. and a piece of toast with a pat of butter and a glass of milk? Right. But we can buy drugs and, and have them take Ritalin so that they'll be calm? Grits will make them calm. Something warm, <laughs> I agree. Something warm in their stomach will make them calm. And turn out lunch, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a country girl. So at lunch, you mean to say we can't buy pinto beans and have some grandmother come in there and cook them and when lunch comes we can't give every kid a bowl of pinto beans and a piece of cornbread i, I agree because one one of the struggles that we have is with the whole lunch program the kids have to fill out the applications and some kids have to pay a dollar whatever it is per week and some kids don't but we actually have lunch servers who if that child hasn't paid that dollar will not give the child that lunch they'll throw it away in front of them yeah well, so what kind of sense does that make none Right, because what we want is all American youngsters to start their day with a full belly so that they can be prepared to learn. We want them to take their break. As in when, when you and I were in school, we got a half a pint of milk right. and a cookie, and the cookie was a um, uh, like a shortbread cookie. Correct. I still like because I don't like sweet. Um, I don't like cookies with icing and stuff like that on it or in it. I like those little shortbread, little butter cookies, right? Then you rest it. Then you went out and you did your 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 uh, uh, gym things, your Correct. outside things. You came back and you studied. That's then right. Then you had your lunch period. You know, and the day goes on. But the idea of a, of, of school starting at uh, eight and ending at three is crazy. Oh, it, it was all based on on the, the need for for, this for farming. Time. For, agri for yeah. agriculture. I've said that for years, that we're yeah. still running schools on the agricultural model. And it's ridiculous. And we've gone through so many different, we've gone through industry, we've gone through yeah. mechanical, we've gone through, uh, now we're in the information and technological and zipping past that, and we're still teaching in the agricultural model. Yeah, and, and it's time to stop because it, it's very hard on parents. Yes. Because you're, you're trying to get to work at the same time you're trying to get your kid. So we need to be able to, parents need to be able to drop the kid off, and parent, and school needs to go a, lo a little bit longer. I agree. Mm -hmm. and, and and I'm a school principal, and I agree with you. And we need to pay our teachers. And that would have been I another agree. thing I wanted to hear, that no matter what the depression is, why can we? Why do we have money for AIG in the banks, <laughs> and we don't have any money for a public school teacher for the people who are, in fact, ensuring our future? Oh, see, now you're preaching now. I, I mean, you you there. I mean, I, in terms of, I agree with you, in terms of how yeah. money is spent and, and where your priority yeah. is. because. Yeah. Teaching is what allows anyone to do whatever they do. Exactly. We so we go have to make, yeah. I mean, that, again, these are the kind of things that made me 
crazy because we know that the best, there, there is no trickle down. And, and right. I know that Barack Obama, like everybody knows that, there is no such thing as if we give enough rich people money, right. they in fact will spend it and help everybody. <laughs> That's right. There's only trickle up. That's correct. If we give enough poor people jobs, they will continue to buy things. Right. And when they do, it will in fact en enhance the uh, economy. So, you know, we need to stop that. This Look at all true. that money we spent, those billions. And there's nothing to show for it. That, that's true. I, I, I'm, and now we are in 100% agreement yeah. there in terms of things like that. And I agree with you, our priorities in terms of our spending. And it's interesting with this recession how pricing has come down based on the fact that finally folks are waking up and realize folks just don't have the money. Yeah. As you go into restaurants now, you're getting uh, all kinds of wonderful deals, two for mm -hmm. 20 and all that. And you say, well, that's what it was all to begin with. Oh, yeah. You've been overcharging us the whole time. Exactly. And again, I, as someone who grew up, you know, in very, very limited circumstances, right. it, poor people have always gotten screwed. It's Correct. It's not that we mind getting screwed. It's that we mind getting screwed all of the time. Correct. <laughs> Give me a break sometimes. <laughs> you know. It's true. It really is. And now that, you know, for, uh, middle class, for the most part, is getting screwed. That's why folks are yeah. beginning to squawk. Oh, yeah. That's why, you know, the squeaky oil uh, or the squeaky wheel is beginning yeah. to get oiled is because the squeaky wheel moved up. Well, and, and the middle class should. I mean, you know, your teachers should be complaining. Yes. You know, I mean, and it's not that, they, that they're whiny. It's that you can't get your job done if you don't have if chalk. Correct. And, and if you don't have students who are... Uh, coming to you prepared Correct. and I really get so sick of you know your parents need to do this do you, do you think parents wake up in the morning and say <laughs> I'm gonna harm my child right. parents are doing the best they can so our job in leadership our job is to try to help students and, and other young people understand Correct. your parents are not deliberately doing something against you they are going to be limited because they've had limited service right. how do we break that circle right. how correct. do we blame somebody for it how do we break it correct do, and, and that's why we're, you know, I know in my school we're, we're looking to put together something to help parents because a lot, of, you know, what a lot of people take for granted is just what you just said. You send the kid home and say, "Have your parent help you with homework," yeah. not realizing the parent may really not know how to help. They want to help, but they just don't know how. They don't know how. Because like some of the things that my kids would bring me, I'd look at that, and I'm an educator, and I'd still look at them like they had three heads. Because they look at me, Dad, that's not the way the teacher said we do it now. You have the new math, or this, that, and the other. <laughs> that's true. But you realize, as, and you do as a principal, one of the, the, the things that has baffled me, I was a part of something called Roanoke uh, 2000, and uh, it's because I live in the in the southwest area, Roanoke, our major city. And one of my suggestions to the committee, because we had a committee of 21 of us, trying to say, how, how will schools go into the future? Okay. I don't even know why. I'm be honest with you, Mark, that I was on the, cause I, I, I've never, I never pleased these people. But, <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay, there's everybody in Nikki. And my first thing was, that, you know, am I mistaken, but aren't, aren't uh, schools, all of them, elementary, high school, all of them, aren't school, middle schools, aren't they always 24 hours available? Don't we have to keep the pipes going? Don't we have to keep heat on? And so everybody went like, yeah, then why aren't we using it? Well, that's, why aren't we yeah. allowing parents to come in that's after right. work for a couple of hours? And why aren't we helping them to be able to help themselves? And why aren't we using it? That's correct. And, What's and keeping us from using these buildings for 24 and Nothing's dumber than a closed school. You, you, <laughs> you're right like on. You still have to keep the building up to snuff. That's correct, because the lights stay on yeah, and the heat stays to. on. It has to. You're correct. Yeah. It, it does, and, and it's funny because the new superintendent for the Patterson School System, that's his thinking as well. And he's from North Carolina. His thinking is the same way. It's like, the young what? people are coming up with new ideas, but we, we should be utilizing them. We should be utilizing with the grandparents. Correct. Because we have old people who feel useless, and we have young people who don't really know old people. Right. They just see old people as an inconvenience. Right. You're talking about cutting down on crime. What would happen if we just took the average middle school? You know, just the middle school, because that's when they get crazy. Correct. And brought in the older people to serve lunch, to sit in the lunchroom with them, just to sit at the table, have lunch, and talk. And it's so funny that you would bring that up, because I had sent an email to my two guidance because we have a, a senior services home right across the street from my school. Ah, yes. And I said, I want you to go over there and forge a relationship, because I want the kids to start interacting. They can adopt a senior. Exactly. The kids can adopt a senior. Or we could start doing concerts there. They can come to our concert. We can do artwork for them and donate it to them. It would... It, it, it oh, does a whole bunch of different things. It would, and it would be good for everyone. Correct. It's for a win-win for everyone. And the young people. That's correct. It would be another pair of eyes helping you 
to know and, and helping the average of people your age, you know, to understand, oh, I think that Johnny is a bully. I don't like, you know, I, I notice on the, then you can do some intervention before right. Johnny grows up to go on the Internet with his daddy's uh, credit card and buys an AK-47. <laughs> exactly. And, and and to top that off, no one ever knows that Johnny's doing that. I mean, that always blows me away, too. Nobody but knows nobody nothing. Nobody does, but nobody knows who to tell. That's correct. And that's why I love having old people around, because they notice things. They're very quiet with it, but they don't know. You know, you and I know now. Well, let's go ask Miss Smith. She was sitting over there in that window all day, every day. All right. Somebody sees these things. Well, it's true. And and you actually, being at Virginia Tech, you actually were a part of someone who lost their mind and well, went down there and started with these guns we're talking about. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm very much anti-gun violence. Uh, yeah, I, I taught um, the shooter in the uh, April 16th tragedy. But again, I, and I've always said, and I'd just like to be clear, I wasn't judging this young man. He was disrupting my class. No. And as a student, you can't have, as a teacher. No, that's correct. And so all I was trying to do is... is is to come back and protect my classroom. That was all. No, no, no. And, it, and it's not even a matter. I, I, I was asking the question from the standpoint of having actually lived with, in that scenario, from yeah. the standpoint of, like when Columbine, no one, uh, according to, to the, right, no yeah, one knew anything about these boys until they lost their minds. Um, and, and a lot you, of people, you know, and, and, you know uh, there's a wonderful book, um, Columbine, it's with the white cover. There's two books on Columbine, only one is good. But actually, a lot of people knew. And uh, one of the mothers that's my uh, point. Yeah, she had been calling and calling and calling, but nobody wanted to believe it. That, that's and my again, point. Accessibility of guns. If 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 uh, Eric and, and 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 Dylan hadn't been able to purchase guns, right? And you know there were friends who purchased them for them, and they knew, right? You know what? Somebody comes in, you say, "Would you mind buying a rifle for me?" You know, you have to say, "No." Right. Oh. You know, come on now. And uh, people did know, but you shouldn't be able to buy a gun over the internet. Correct. You should not. I mean. You know, if if I was sick right now, if I was sniffing, I have a cold. Now, I'm not not swine flu, just a regular. I have a cold. That's right. And I said, gee, I have a cold. What I need is is penicillin. If I could just have a couple of penicillin pills, because you know, they, I'll I'll be fine. I can go to the drugstore and I say, hi, I'm I'm trying to catch a cold. I'd like to buy a couple of penicillin <laughs> pills, please. I can't get it. That's right. I can't get it because it's like, no, we we we're not going to dispense this drug to you. To help save you from this cold, right. you have to have someone knowledgeable right. to write a prescription. But if I said, hi, I'm, I'm thinking about killing a few people. It's okay if I buy a gun. Everybody, oh, sure. What kind do you want, baby? That's right. You know, what, what kind of sense does that make? That's right. For those of you in the listening audience, if you've, for whatever reason, just joining us, you're listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley, and my extremely special guest this morning is Nikki Giovanni. That's right, the one, the only, the world-renowned poet, writer, commentator, activist, educator, Nikki Giovanni, is talking with me. We're conversating about a plethora of things, and... Of course, we started talking about her, her writing, and now we kind of went into our activist and educator <laughs> modes in terms of, and that's a good thing. Well, I'm and that's why I wanted you on here, because like, people need to hear. People need to think. They need to critically think. And you're right. If you if you look at the whole gun thing and really think about it, it just, it's, it's, it's been foolish. It's still foolish. It will always be it will foolish. Always be foolish yes. But, you know, let, let me shift just a little bit since I got you here, Mark, and this is the reading circle. You know my favorite book yes. last year? Which it's a one? Book called, oh, it's so beautiful. It's a book called Song Yet Sung Song? by James McBride. Okay. Song Yet Sung. And it's about the Underground Railroad in Eastern Maryland. Yes. And again, it's a question. Uh, James, <clears throat> who I've had the pleasure of meeting, James was uh, trying to work on another book, was not doing anything very well. Of course, the, the we who write know that if you're having what is called writer's block, you just don't right. have enough information. That's right. And so James was driving around, just trying to clear his head, and saw a sign that said Harriet Tubman, you know, and pointed to where Tubman had been. And he said, well, what is Tubman doing here on the Eastern Shore? But, you know, Harriet did not get slaves from the Deep South. I mean, it was de it was it was deep enough, but, you know, that's where she operated. And he's 80 miles from Washington, D.C., so his next question is, who helped her? Well, it had to be the... Um, the, the, the watermen. Right. The black guys on the water, right? Well, then your next question is, and why wouldn't they, being only 80 miles and watermen, why wouldn't they just sell and go on to D.C. and be free? Right. Because they felt an obligation to free other people. Absolutely. Yeah. They sacrificed their freedom for others. And so James started to pursue that. 
And in doing it, he came up with the novel, Song Yet Sung. It is the most in incredible book. Well, I tell you what, needless to say, the fact that you have now brought it up, I will be making a trip to the bookstore or oh, yeah. lettering it online. Or something. That's how I get my collection of books, is from recommendations and reading other books. Mm. So what's the who's the author? James McBride. You know him because uh, okay. Spike Lee just did uh, the, the book on St. Anne. Exactly. St. Anne. And he also had a, a, a nominee, a, a National Book Club nominee, on the book The Color of Water. Okay, yes. But right now, of course, this opus is, is Song Yet Sung. It's Song a Yet Sung. gorgeous, okay. gorgeous book. And you begin to see these inner relationships. Well, I would be getting a copy of that today. Before oh, yeah. The, before oh. the sun sets, I'll have a copy of that in my <laughs> yeah, hand, unless no. they're sold out. <laughs> oh, no, it, it, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. James is a great young man. And uh, it, it, so this was, uh, we were talking about what I did last summer. I caught up on a lot of reading, because yes. when you're writing, you're doing your own research. You know, Correct. you're doing things, feeding in. And so it was just great. I have a Kindle, which I love. And it was just absolutely great to just sit on the beach. Or I, I went up to visit uh, Ashley Bryan, the children's author, and okay. Ashley's uh, 87. And I had been saying for a long time, he lives up in Maine, and I'd been saying, Ashley, I'm going to come up and visit. And he'd be like, yeah, you got to come up. And something said, and I always listen to something, i got to tell you, that, something said, call Ashley. So I picked up the phone, and he answered. I said, what are you doing home? Because he's usually in China. He's right. in school in Africa. I said, what are you doing home? He said, I just got home this morning. I said, Ash, this, I, I'm coming up. And I drove over to D.C. I, I live on the other side of the state. I drove over to D.C. and I took the train up to Maine, which was wonderful. And just sat down, had a glass of wine, you know, going up and, and enjoyed reading. I've been catching up on my reading. Good for and, you. And uh, just enjoying it. That's, I know. I, yeah. And I love your spirit. Because, see, I, I have a goal of being 100 and healthy. <laughs> and that's that's I, I don't know what God's plan is, but that's my plan is to be yeah. hundred and healthy, and and I say a hundred and healthy because I mean I want to have the spirit and the the, the yeah. verve and the, the being active and alive and being able to come and go at a hundred just as I had whenever I was ten, and I get that feel from you as I talk to you as I saw you on the interview with Bill Moyers and yeah. as I read your material I just get that feeling of you love life. Oh it, no, that was, Bill is a great guy, and his wife actually is a, a has always been a big fan of mine. So it was really uh, fun to come onto the show. And, of course, you know, he's flirting with me. To yes. Right there. I saw His wife is sitting right there. That's so it was right. Like, oh. And I found him. I said, Bill, you know, old ladies have hormones. So he's <laughs> That's right. But uh, he's a wonderful. Uh, it was a lot of fun doing that show. And I think it probably showed, you know, the joy showed through. <laughs> it did. It came through because I was yeah. watching it. And that's whenever I said, I'm going to contact her. And it, because it came through so well. And I oh, said, yeah. and I went out. Matter of fact, just like I told you, I'm going to get the song. The no, song, that song book. Yeah. That's the way I did your book with bicycles. Whenever oh, I saw you on the show, the next day I was at the bookstore. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're gonna feel the same when you be calling James because uh, it's that. That's a wonderful book. It's something reading circle. Something your 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 listeners would definitely enjoy because it's 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 history, but it's not you know a poem. It's not something that you say, oh gosh, you know. I don't. I don't have time to read a 600-page book. Right. And, and, and it is a page turner, by the way. All right. Song and, but it, yet it's only sung. like 200 pages. All you know, right. It's, it's something that you um, and and not that it 